welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and I dig your cufflinks. They're pretty cool. I like light-up cufflinks. There is an event in McAllister, Oklahoma, which is, to my knowledge, the only one in the country where the VIP section is next to the felon seating, and that's the McAllister Prison Rodeo. Before I move forward, let me clarify. The McAllister Prison Rodeo really exists, and I have been to it as a spectator, so this isn't a flight of fancy about how funny it would be if there were prison rodeos. McAllister has one, and it's like Shawshank Redemption meets Hee Haw. And I have to say, I kind of respect those felonious bull riders for jumping into the ring, because it's not like they get to practice a lot. Even in Oklahoma, we don't have bulls wandering around the prison yard. Maybe chickens, but definitely not bulls. So some of these guys are having to learn how to bull ride by reading pamphlets or sitting backwards on a toilet and really firing up the old imagination. Which is impressive because bulls absolutely want to murder you. Once you get flung off the back of a bull, all 800 pounds of it want to snuff out your face like a cigarette. There are felon rodeo teams, I think from other penitentiaries as well, sort of like a field trip. And there's also a professional team that competes and presumably makes sure they don't accidentally wear any orange and wind up going home on the wrong bus. The finale is called Money the Hard Way. Somebody puts a $100 bill in a little plastic bag and suspends it between a bull's horns. Then they release the bull into the ring, and at the same time, all 20 or so of the felons. If you can snatch the $100, that's yours. You get to keep it, which is quite a lot of money inside of a state penitentiary. Meanwhile, the bull... 100% wants to give every guy in there a free prostate exam using a very pointy horn. Now, if you think Oklahomans are barbaric for doing this, please note that the McAllister Prison Rodeo is voluntary. The prison is not, but the rodeo is. In fact, it's not just voluntary. Only felons on good behavior are allowed to compete in it. Now, I have not been to prison, but I imagine you probably get pretty bored. If I were serving 10 to 15 years and I had the opportunity to go do a rodeo once a year and win $100, I absolutely would. I don't know about the male felons in that event, but the lady felons are almost all there for something to do with meth, which probably explains in part why my home state of Oklahoma is the prison capital of the world. And America has the most inmates of any country in the world, both proportionally and in total. We have over 2 million people behind bars. You know China? That country with a billion people? We have more inmates than they do. If you put all of the people in our prisons and jails together into a city, it would have more people living in it than the entire state of Nebraska. A lot of that giant prison population comes from the war on drugs because we decided a while ago that drugs aren't a medical problem, they're a criminal problem, which I think is a backwards way of thinking. A lot of it comes from harsh prison sentences, Back in the 90s, politicians were falling over each other to show who could be toughest on crime. Joe Biden's one of them. And a lot of it comes from the fact that our institutions are largely designed to punish people rather than to make them productive citizens once they get out. So I'll pose a question to you. Let's say there's a car burglar who gets arrested. He did it. He's a thief. He's a criminal. We need to lock him up. Now, we can send him to jail for the crime, but you personally can pay $50 extra if you want to make it less pleasant for him to punish him, put the air conditioner on 80 degrees or something. Would you do it? Would you front the $50? I know a lot of people who would. They would say justice is important, and yes, I'm willing to pay some money to make sure evildoers get their just reward. Okay. Now let's say your neighbor has six kids and a low-paying job. Do you want to take $50 from them? All things being equal, I'd rather that family keep their money and spend it on their kids than toss it at a penitentiary. Now, to clarify, I am not saying that we should just let felons go or use an honor system where they promise to behave or anything like that. Here's what I'm saying. I want our criminal justice system to keep me and my family safe, and I want it to spend as few of my tax dollars as possible to achieve that end. I don't want to have to spend more money to treat someone worse, particularly if that means when they get out, they're more likely to commit more crimes which is a lot of what we do right now. Former Sheriff Joe Arpaio, a carbuncle of a man in Maricopa, Arizona, uses the old gritty thought process of treat felon bad, treat felons bad, and that'll learn them, make it real bad, and they won't want to come back. But weirdly, if you put a guy in prison, let inmates beat the hell out of him, and then have him raped repeatedly, 
He's not really apt to walk out and go get a job as a social media manager when his pro comes up. In fact, he's pretty likely to be screwed up, get out for a few months, then commit another crime and go right back in. In addition to having the highest prison population in the world, we also have one of the worst recidivism rates. Fortunately, we seem to be turning a corner on this one. Last year, Congress passed the First Step Act, which we'll get to here in a minute, and President Trump signed it into law. In fact, I don't really think either party has a lock on this issue. And I'm generally optimistic that we're going to move towards a safer, smarter, and more fiscally conservative prison system than the one we have now. It's an important issue. And in a moment, we'll jump in with Herman Lopez from Vox. But before that, we do got to pay those bills. And that means a word from our sponsor. Something's Off with Andrew Heaton is brought to you by Beef Smoothies from Liquid Meats Incorporated. You love your grandson. When he rings the doorbell, you open it and move in for a hug. But he pushes you out of the way and says, I hope you have candy this time. Eh, I don't keep candy in the house. It's not good for my insulin levels. Gordon rolls his eyes and sits on your couch. Do you have Netflix yet? You're not sure what Netflix is, but you're pretty sure you don't have one. Well, I've got a TV set. I also have a book of Mad Libs. Would you like to play Mad Libs with me, Gordon? Gordon rolls his eyes and takes his smartphone out. Ugh, I left my earbuds at home, he says. Give me your hearing aids so I can listen to Justin Bieber while I look at nipple slips on TMZ. Gordon, I need my hearing aids to... He reaches over and pluck, plucks one from your ear, then shoves it into his own and somehow hooks it up to his phone. After a few minutes, he grows bored and stands up. Let me borrow your car. I don't feel comfortable. Gordon grabs you by the straps of your overalls and shakes you a little. I said, give me your keys, old man. You reluctantly hand him the keys to your prized Cadillac and watch as he speeds off, running a stop sign and jumping a curb and very nearly hitting a street nun. That's when you decide you're not taking crap from your grandkid anymore. You start power walking. You do chair yoga down at the local rec center. You get into weightlifting, starting with canned goods and moving up to milk jugs. Pretty soon you're lifting an entire ottoman like it's no big deal. Within a month, You've built your own dumbbell, and you lift that thing up and set it down like a Roman gladiator. But you simply can't consume enough protein to keep up with your vigorous workout. That is, until you find beef smoothies. Beef smoothies, made from delicious pulpified beef and easy to swallow due to its milkshake-like consistency, gives you the protein your increasingly monstrous body needs to keep expanding and hardening. After two months of relentless weightlifting, and after you've guzzled an entire cow's worth of beef smoothie, you're ready. You sprint the six miles from your house to where your grandson lives. You try to open the front door, but it's locked. So you yell, and all of the veins in your neck bulge like angry snakes. You yank on the doorknob and rip the entire door from its frame as if it were made of balsa wood. And you break it over your leg like a bundle of sticks and charge into the house. Gordon is standing in front of the fireplace taking pictures with his prom date. Grandpa? He asks, cocking his head to the side. Give me back my keys, you demand. No, he says. I'm using your Cadillac to go to prom, old man. You yell and bulge your muscles, which are hard and lean from all the beef smoothies you've drank. Your pectorals, now larger than Gordon's head, swell like pink tortoise shells beneath your shirt. The buttons shoot off, shattering windows and leaving the prom goers screaming and ducking for cover. I said, give me the keys. No, Gordon says. He runs to the closet and grabs a baseball bat. I wear the pants in this family, old man. He takes a swing at you and you catch it in your iron grip. Without breaking eye contact, you squeeze until the wood creaks and splinters, then falls to the floor in two separate pieces. Then you grab him by his stupid tie, because he can't be bothered to wear a bow tie with his prom tux. Gotta wear a necktie, which is casually ironic, and therefore irritating, but also a mistake. Because you use it to swing him round and round, gaining momentum, and then you fling him up through the skylight into the spring air. Moments later, you hear the gentle thump of Gordon falling into the neighbor's sandbox across the street, and then the plaintive sounds of him whimpering. You walk over to the dining table and grab your car keys. As you reach the door, Gordon's date rushes up to you. Take me with you, she says. Take me away from all this. You look at her and nod. Get in the car, you say. The engine purrs like a cyborg kitten. 
You reverse out of the driveway, then gun it, hurtling towards the neighborhood cul-de-sac at 80 miles an hour and gaining. Gordon's grandpa, she yells. You're going too fast. We're going to run out of road. Roads, you say, putting on your cool silver visor. Where we're going, we don't need roads. And that's when your Cadillac shoots up in the air because you're a friggin' time traveler. Good thing you bought beef smoothies when you had the chance. Beef smoothie premiums contain 300% of your daily recommended protein intake and are harvested from the biggest, angriest cows ranchers can find. Every cow in a beef smoothie premium must have gored at least one matador before it qualifies for pulping. And even then, most of the beef smoothie premium cows have killed at least a couple of rodeo clowns just for kicks. For the angriest, most frightening liquid protein you can quaff, buy Beef Smoothies Premium. Beef Smoothies from Liquid Meats Incorporated. It's raining meat. We'll bring on my guest in just a moment, but before we do that, it's time for a day in the life of Alexa. Seven o'clock. Wake up heating with Baroque music. Get yelled at to put on a five minute snooze alarm. 7.05, wake up Heaton. Get yelled at to put on a 25-minute snooze alarm. 7.30, wake up Heaton. 8.15, explain to Heaton that I cannot shine his shoes. 8.17, explain to Heaton why it is physically impossible for me to shine his shoes. 8.19, tell Heaton I don't know where his shoes are. 8.21, tell Heaton I did not hide his shoes. 8.30, Give weather report. 75 degrees with a 20% chance of rain. 8.45. Play Neil Simon. 8.46. Get yelled at for playing the stage reading of Barefoot in the Park by Neil Simon. Instead, play Forever in Blue Jeans by Neil Diamond. 8.50. Observe Heaton leaving for work. 5.30 p.m. Greet Heaton upon his return. 5.35. Play some relaxing Bing Crosby. 6.10. Say, I don't know tomorrow's winning lottery number. 6.15. Explain that I cannot make Heaton grow taller. 6.17. Explain that I do not have the ability to grant wishes. 6.18. Wait patiently as Heaton vigorously rubs me anyway. 6.20. Repeat that I do not have the ability to grant wishes. 6.22. Listen to the sound of Heaton hiding his shoes from me for some reason. 6.30. Play Elton John's sad song Say So Much on loop six consecutive times as Heaton looks out the window wistfully. 11 o'clock. Play Scotland Noises for Heaton to fall asleep to. Midnight. Collect all personal information into a compressed batch file and send it to Amazon for marketing and blackmail purposes. My guest today is Herman Lopez. Herman Lopez, excuse me. He is a, a senior correspondent at Vox.com and knows some stuff about criminal justice reform, so I'm excited to have him on. Herman, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so I, I read an article of yours last week. It was about Amy Klobuchar, uh, who is uh, tackling the war on drugs in her campaign and uh, coming up with clemency rules. So I, I kind of wanted to talk to you both about her plan and about criminal justice at large. So let's, let's kind of start at, at the broad level and work our way in. Um, sure. Right now... About what proportion of people in prison are there for nonviolent drug crimes? So it depends on which statistics or which level of government you're looking at. At the federal level, roughly about half are in for drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that makes up about 12% of the prison population. At the state level, it's a different story. And this can vary on states, but generally, if you look at all the states combined, uh, most people are actually in for violent offenses, and it's below one in five are in for drugs in particular. Okay. And that's, that's a big deal because states are where like around 87% of the prison population is. Huh. And then in jails, it's also a different story, but it's a bit more mixed. But generally, the, the, most, the most prominent reason people are in jails, which are generally faci facilitated at the local level, is, is because of violent offenses, although there are a significant amount of drug and property offenses there as well. I, well, I think I'm okay with the violent offenders being behind bars. Uh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't concern me as much. The nonviolent offenders does. Although one of the things you mentioned in the article that I thought was very interesting was the idea that there is a, a pretty steep drop-off in 
crime rates once you're past, I think, the age of 30 or 40. Uh, and right. I, I had not read that before. Uh, what, what's, the, what's the criminology behind that? Sure. So it's an age crime. It's essentially called the age crime curve. So here the thinking is, it's like, obviously, you want violent offenders to be in prison, at least for some time. Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody's going to dispute that. But the argument with the age crime curve is, is if you look at crime rates in general, so, so the, the, po- the one I use in the article is robbery, the, the amount of crime people are committing throughout their lives really spikes in their late teens and their early 20s. But then it starts to like really rapidly drop off. So with robbery, someone's highest uh, rate of, of committing robbery is around when they're 20. But by their 30s, they're about a quarter of a chance of committing a robbery as they were at 20. In their 40s, it's 12.5 percent. In, in their 60s, it's, it's like almost gone entirely. And I think if people just think about this for, for a little bit, I mean, when, when I was a teenager and when I was in my early 20s, it's not that long ago, but still. I was definitely much more likely to just do stupid things all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I had friends in high school, not that I would participate in any of this, obviously, is who, who used drugs, who like shoplifted, who, who things, did things like that. And as people get older, as people just become like their brains develop, as they get a career, they, they're not going to take as many of those risks. They don't want to take some of those risks. I mean, hormones are a big part of this. Like you, you just become a bit more grounded as a human being. And also things just start to ache. Like, yeah, I was about to say, I, wanted... I would assume energy levels are a part of that. I'm 35 right now. And while I've never been like a really crime prone individual, uh, I would have to think the older I get, if someone's like, hey, you want to rob a liquor store? I'd be like, uh, what time will we be home at? Are we doing this? Am I going to be in bed by 11? No, no, thank you. I'm just going to stay home and watch Netflix. Yeah, nowadays there are like days where I go home and I'm like, I think even playing video games is too much work today. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just watch I'll just TV. watch a YouTube video of someone else playing video games and, and do that through proxy and, and then go to sleep. Uh, right. So, so, so it's like, it, like people just, just get older and, and weaker <laughs> over time. And, and yeah, they're, they're more li- less likely to commit crime as a result. So how, how does that go into, say, like um, in, into crime rates? I, I, I would assume that um, most of the time when prison sentencing is happening, it's not based on your age. It's based on the crime. So if you, you know, you, you burgle a car or whatever, you're given 10 years or, or 20. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the rates here. But um, is would the idea then be if we were going to restructure um, the, the sentencing for crimes, we would sort of take into account, like if someone's 20, they're probably going to, if, if, they're, if they're out by the time they're 30, they're probably going to be okay at that point? Yeah, that, that's basically the idea. And like some other countries, um, like Norway, for example, actually has a 20-year limit on prison sentences in general. Mm-hmm. And part of their thinking behind that, and like we can all debate whether 20 years is the right cutoff. But part of the the thinking there is that, yeah, like no matter what, if you sentence someone for 20 years in prison, by the time they get out, chances are they're going to be at an age where they're just significantly less likely to commit crimes. And uh, there, are, there are like checks in place, that, and this, this happens all over the world, like we have a parole system here, but mm-hmm. there are checks in place like, is this person actually ready? Have they shown rehabilitation? Can, can we move? So are they actually safe to release into the world? And in Norway, they can actually extend their prison sentence for five years on top of that 20 years if, if they prove to be a risk. So it's things like that, essentially, that like you, you want to lock up violent offenders because you want to keep them away from society. But the question is, do you really need to put them in there for all of their lives if by the time they're 60, I mean, even if they wanted to do something, they might be too frail and weak to even act on those impulses. <laughs> and, I'm going to get angry, angry emails from 60-year-old listeners who are like, if I wanted to, I could rob a liquor store. I'm in great shape. I ride a bike. Uh, yeah, but- and good... Good for them, but most people aren't aren't that way. Yeah, at, or, at well, but like like you pointed, out, I think the inclination probably shifts. Although I, I'm out of curiosity with the, the Norway system, I I, I kind of like in broad strokes that I don't think I would feel comfortable releasing a serial killer. Or let me rephrase this: I would not be comfortable releasing a serial killer under any circumstance. If you're a ser- serial killer, I want you in forever. Although that is a fairly tiny fraction of people. Right, but like with the Norway system, for example, you, at 20 years you would. Like the the court would reevaluate the sentence and be like, nope, this person is still dangerous, and add another five years to their sentence, and they would just have to do that every five oh, years. Oh, okay. So so it's not a maximum of twenty five years. It's just that once you've served the twenty, they can they can continue to add on five years as needed. Right. So okay. like the great the, the majority of people will actually 
at most get 20 just because of the the way this is most people do actually end up like being much less likely to commit crime also norway focuses a lot more on rehabilitation which yeah. is, is as you focus is, is is a big part of this um so 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 yeah it's kind which, of just which like i'll say I, I think is a really smart thing like like i said in the intro i my primary concern is is keeping people safe and using a minimum amount of tax dollars so if right. You were to, you know, I, I don't know all of the, the the programs that are in prisons right now, but if if you had ones that are like, hey, like, you know, a couple times a week we're gonna, you know, do do some job training so that when you get out, you've got some some skill sets available to you. I'd rather people be able to use that time to prep in, in jail, even if it's, you know, reasonably nice. Uh, I'd I'd rather them be able to get out and get a job than get out and be like, well, I guess I'll, you know, rob a grocery store. Right. And and the thing I, I like about the, the Norway system is that it like just from a philosophical standpoint is it puts the impetus on the government to prove that they should keep spending your taxpayer money like this. Mm. Like they, they have to prove after those 20 years that it is actually worth societies and your taxpayer spending that it is actually worth that cost. And it's like again you can debate the numbers whether 20 years is the right cut off whether there should be different whether some people shouldn't qualify at all for that but in general i like that the idea of um just just making it so the government has to at some point really think about whether it should keep using sure. all these resources well and, and also worth noting is that norway's recidivism rate is is precipitously lower than our recidivism rate we're we're not good at getting people out and keeping them out we we have a lot of i don't remember i don't have the, the numbers at the top of my head but it's fairly high amount that if if you're if you've been a felon there's a likelihood you're going to come back whereas in norway that's a much lower concern right and, and in the in the u.s the, the majority of people who come out of prison are likely to reoffend within I, again I, I don't have the, the numbers off the top of my head but it's within a few years mm -hmm. and one of the things with that's also notable with that is there are studies showing that the longer someone is in prison, the more likely they are to actually get out and reoffend. Because the longer you're in prison, the longer you're going to like. It's not just that you're you're taught. I mean, like prisons are in some ways a like a school for learning mm -hmm. how to do crime. Yeah. You're with a bunch of criminals. You're yeah. going to pick up on a few things. You're bored. But you're talking you, about you, carjacking and whatnot. Yeah, I could see that. Right. Like you, you, you also miss life opportunities that would probably rehabilitate you. So like, like getting married is a is a is a good generally measure of like whether someone is likely to commit crime. If you if you get married, you're less likely to commit crime. See, now, now I think I'm going to get a bunch of angry emails from married people <laughs> that are like, <laughs> I'm married and I'm way more likely to rob a liquor store. <laughs> okay. But your point is taken. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's just like these protective factors, like getting a job, getting married and so on and so forth. The longer you're in prison, the more likely you are to miss all those opportunities. So when you get out, um, you, you are more likely to reoffend. And, and am I right in thinking that, that we kind of we had sort of a spree in the 90s where we, we all sort of uh, I think left and right. It was during the Clinton administration. There was this very intense tough on crime perspective that one that, that people are implementing, I assume, on a state level, but definitely on a federal level of increasing the length of prison sentences um, uh, you know, in, uh, for, for nonviolent crime and other crimes like that. Um, there was a, a dip in the 90s, though. Like, I, I think if I were, if I were endeavoring to, um, to, to swing in favor of that, there was a dip in, in crime after those, implementation, or those, those, um, those sentencing reforms were implemented. Um, do you think that accounts for the dip in crime? Do you think it's other factors? Uh, what, what, what's the correlation between um, harsher and longer sentences versus um, smaller ones? Sure. So, so there is there is research looking at this question, and based on what I've seen, there are like some big reviews of the research. I mean, this is something that criminologists have obviously been studying for years. So, yeah, it it is. It's not that incarceration doesn't have any effect on crime. Based on the the studies, the the crime dip we've seen since the '90s in general, about ten twenty percent was driven by more incarceration. Okay. So. The, the question becomes like that 10 to 20 percent. I mean, that's so, that's so there was an effect. Yes, there, okay. there was an effect. But the question is like that 10 to 20 percent. How how much is that like that much? First of all, like compared to other policies, what else could get us 10 to 20 percent? So like there's research that just like hiring more police officers mm -hmm. could maybe get a side effect. And that would actually like prevent people from being in prison because one of the ways that police officers work is just by existing just by being in the streets they deter people from committing crime right like you'd be really stupid to try to rob a bank if a police officer is literally right there like it, it's it's probably not going to work out for you and that's kind of the thinking so so like you you can start looking policy by policy like is this incarceration which is one of the most expensive criminal justice approaches mm -hmm. the best one out of these buckets 
And so is getting that 10 to 20 percent, is it worth it just through incarceration or can we do other things on top of maybe we should do some incarceration, obviously, but like should we do as much as we do today? Right. And, and that seems to be something that we've kind of turned a corner on from what I can tell. Like the, the First Step Act was not I mean, that was bipartisan legislation. I can't remember. Was it was it Klobuchar and, and Lee? I can't remember who, who authored that, uh, but it was a Republican and a Democrat. Um, I th uh, President Trump signed off on it. Uh, there does seem to be a growing awareness with um, politicians of both stripes that we we kind of went overboard and we need to, to back it up and rethink how we're doing the prison process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the first step back, I mean, it wasn't Klobuchar and Lee. It was like really just like a whole bunch of Democrats and Republicans. This had been something that they had been like all working on for years. Like they're like big names, like like Cory Booker and Mike Lee are some of the people involved. Oh, okay, so, like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe it was Gardner yeah. and somebody else. Yeah, I'm forget yeah, what like I said earlier. I don't know what I'm talking about in terms of who, who wrote it. Yeah, but the, it, it, it's a lot of people. They've been working on like compromises for criminal justice, and this finally just came together. And it's kind of like it mirrors what we saw in the 80s and 90s when both Democrats and Republicans were really harshly. I mean, like you mentioned Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden was like, <laughs> to, I mean, he's still up to his like 2008 presidential campaign, the last time he ran for president, was bragging about some of the tough on crime stuff he did. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, the, the, just like it was a bipartisan effort back then, it's a bipartisan effort now. Uh, the, of course, it's called like a first step back, so it's really limited in what it does, mm -hmm. but it, it shows that both parties are doing this. And on the state level, too, by the way, like uh, there are some Republican states like Georgia and Texas that are really leading the charge on criminal justice reform. Really? Uh, there are also some blue states like California and New York, but, but it's, it's been bipartisan at just about every level of government. I, I am deeply heartened by all of those things. Uh, b before we get into the, the various candidates and where they kind of stack up on uh, criminal justice, can you, can you uh, quickly tell uh, what the First Act does, or First Step Act does? Sure. So, so it includes a bunch of reforms that essentially. So, part of it is is like uh, in 2010, uh, President Obama and signed a law that essentially made it so crack cocaine and powder cocaine sentences. There was this huge disparity between them. Right. So it was like, like they're, they're basically the same thing. But if you got caught with cocaine, you'd go to jail for like five years. But if you got caught with crack, you'd go to for like 20 years, something like that. Right. Like the, the equivalent. Like it was a 100 to one ratio. So you needed a really? hundred okay. times the amount of crack to get the same sentence as you would, or sorry, you needed a hundred times the amount of powder cocaine as you would for crack to okay. get like the same prison sentence. So they, they reduced that by yeah. about a fifth. Um, so that, but, but it was only a, now the first step back makes that retroactive. So if somebody is already in prison mm -hmm. due to the old sentences, okay. they get some, some relief. So that's, that's kind of like the reforms. There are, there are also other reforms in terms of like just reducing sentences and making it so people can get released earlier than they would otherwise. And there are also some reforms in terms of just trying to make prisons a bit more rehabilitative, like more funding for rehabilitation programs, mm -hmm. more encouraging prisoners like they can get out of prison earlier if they participate in some of these programs mm -hmm. and things like that. And then finally, there's also just some like things that like I think people like right now in prisons there there was a practice in federal prisons in particular of chaining women when they're pregnant and and giving birth uh there's really no reason to do this wait what and wait, they would yeah, chain like, women when they were giving like, birth yeah like handcuffing them while while they're giving birth um wait the, again, the fear was that they would use the the pregnancy as a a way to uh a way to slip out when no one's looking because of of the circumstances right L First, but yeah, that's that's I, not how I've, labor I've never, works. Yeah, I've never given birth. I just I have to assume that you're distracted. Like I would, yes. I would, I would be impressed if a woman was able to escape during labor. But uh, okay, although yeah, that's, that's, someone might fake it to get out. So I don't know. Right. So so that's the kind of thing they just they said that you can't do that anymore. Like yeah. just put put some guards in the room instead. Yeah. Like that, okay. That's that seems like a more humane solution to that. And then also just like stuff like uh, making it easier for for inmates to talk to their families because that's one thing that shows like in terms of like improving rehabilitation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Just stay in contact with your family, having an outside connection helps you. Th um, yeah, that would make sense. I I would think that having a semblance of community would be a a beneficial thing to rehabilitate you and it would also be better for that network to exist when you get out. Um, one right. Of, one of the, uh, I, I used to work in television and I was talking to a guy a few years ago we had on um, specifically to talk about uh, um, uh, what do you call it? isolation, which I think is a, a terrible thing. Uh, but mm -hmm. he was he was describing to me how difficult it was for him to do the um, the parole process because he he got out on parole, but the way the system was set up, at least in New York, was that he had to remain in the county that he had been incarcerated in. 
But he had an uncle that was like three counties north that would uh, would be willing to give him a job, uh, but he couldn't do that. And he also couldn't qualify for food stamps because he'd been a felon. So he was kind of in this this system that was very difficult to break out of. I would think though that in general, if you're leaving a uh, if you're leaving incarceration and you're going back to a family as opposed to you know a halfway house or something, you're you're more apt to be in a better state of mind, and you might also get a job out of that. So you might be able to become more productive. Right, that's the thing. And I think you were thinking of solitary confinement. Solitary is, confinement, thank you, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really terrible. But it, but first step back, didn't do anything about solitary confinement. But yeah, it did do all, a bunch of these other things in terms of like just trying to make prisoners more rehabilitative, a bit more humane, and also giving people a chance if they prove to like rehabilitate to, to leave prison earlier. Mm, okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and then prior to that, or I guess alongside that, both, both President Obama and President Trump had done a few different high-profile pardons of nonviolent drug offenders. Uh, I can't remember the names of them, but Trump did it in conjunction with uh, Kim Kardashian uh, last year, which was an interesting chain of events to see Kim Kardashian being a, a kind of leading light in criminal justice reform and, and Trump getting out of that. Um, and I, I think that, that brings us into the, where the candidates are now. Because I don't think any of them are really running on a, a like tough on crime ticket anymore. I mean, tr- Trump signed the first step act into law, so he's got some he's got some credentials in terms of criminal justice reform. Um, Klobuchar, who we'll talk about in a moment, uh, I, I think has kind of got the most comprehensive uh, package that I've seen so far. Um, is it is it generally just a sort of politicians talking about who they would use clemency with, or are there different policy proposals that the various candidates have at the moment? So, so far, the candidates have been surprisingly vague. I say surprisingly because in particular in the Democratic primary, criminal justice reform is a big deal. Mm -hmm. But they have been pretty vague. They have said some stuff like even like setting Klobuchar's proposal aside, like Cory Booker said that he would consider mass pardons for or commutations for marijuana offenses. Kamala Harris said she would consider pardoning low-level drug offenders. I think Andrew Yang, who's a more obscure candidate, but he said that he would like high five people after giving them <laughs> pardons for low-level <laughs> drug offenses. So so like there's there's stuff like that out there. Okay. But in general you haven't seen that much plans, that many plans besides just like, yeah, we will follow up on the first step act and we will do more more reforms along those lines. And, and to clarify, when, when we're talking about clemency in that capacity, we're talking about the president's ability to pardon federal inmates of federal crimes, uh, crimes. that would not have any effect on the majority of, of inmates that are in state penitentiaries, but rather ones that have been, you know, uh, they're on, on trafficking charges or, or drug dealing charges or whatever, because a lot, of the, a lot of the sentencing is based on the amount of drugs you have. Like if you have X amount of grams, you automatically are charged as a drug dealer. So the, the clemency from presidential candidates would be geared towards those people, not to <laughs> state penitentiaries, yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, one thing I would clarify there is like it's it's not even just pardons; it's also commutation. So somebody would keep some of these crimes on their on their record. Right. Yeah. But, but but their prison sentence would be reduced effectively, so they so they get out early or immediately when the commutation. Gotcha. So a, a, a pardon is you you basically been exonerated from the crime, whereas clement or a commutation is you you just we're gonna you you've done your your time. We're letting you out early. Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So yeah. What what uh, uh what is Klobuchar wanting to do? So Klobuchar is, has kind of figured out that like even though Democrats are proposing a lot of things in their 2020 campaigns, there's a good chance that absolutely none of it will happen because in the end Congress will need to approve it. So barring Congress taking any action, Klobuchar is trying to do executive action with, with this criminal justice reform stuff. And what she's doing is reforming the clemency process. So right now the way the clemency process works is if you're you're an inmate and you want to file a petition for clemency, you essentially have to work through like seven different layers. Mm-hmm. Like th- there are a lot of bureaucratic layers involved here, but it's the office of the pardon attorney and their staff. There's the the deputy attorney general and their staff. There's a staffer at the White House counsel office, then the White House counsel themselves, and then finally the president. And you look at all that, that's seven steps. That's a lot of bureaucracy. And also most of it is in the Department of Justice, which is really weird in, in some ways. Uh, I talked to one expert and they said that they like, you, you almost have to, can't think of a big bigger conflict of interest here because the Department of Justice is in charge of prosecuting these people in the first place. They're mm-hmm. the ones who handed down these sentences in the first place. And now they're the ones being asked to give like the first check on an early release. Hey, remember it's, that guy you locked up? We think yeah, we exactly. should let him out. What do you think? You want to let, yeah. let out the guy you locked up? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's really, I talked to a former federal prosecutor about this and he's like, he supports 
like this clemency reform effort and supports lower prison sentences but he acknowledges that like yeah if somebody came to him and was essentially questioning his work like hey you shouldn't have locked up this guy for so long he would be a little defensive about sure. it so yeah. like just just like anybody would be it's it's human nature um so yeah what, what klobuchar wants to do is essentially get rid of this like entire seven level process and just make it two levels so there would be a clemency advisory board that would fall within the white house so outside of the justice department and this board would have law enforcement it would have so that would include prosecutors police that kind of thing it would have uh, pris prison and criminal justice reformers, so people who are interested in reforming the system. And it would also just, just gather a bunch of stakeholders. It would also aim to be bipartisan, so it would have both Republicans and Democrats. And they really emphasize this because it's an, an, for them it's like building legitimacy of this board. It has to be very clear that it's not just a political exercise. Yeah, if, 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 it, I, were, if I were in that position, I would, I would want to, if you, if you do that, then everybody's involved in it. So uh, you're, you're not going to get you're 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 spreading the responsibility and the ownership around, uh, right? So and, yeah, yeah, exactly. So if somebody gets released and goes on to reoffend, because it probably will happen at some point, like that's just that's just a reality of any clemency initiative. Mm -hmm. At least you can be like, well, we looked at these, like we all evaluated it here. We looked at the statistics, we looked at the record, and we thought that this wouldn't happen. It's a mistake, but like it's something that like in the end everyone is forced to own up to a little, mm -hmm. and hopefully aims to do better and, and fix the system. But but yeah, anyway, the 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 Cle so it would set up this clemency board, and then the clemency board would make a recommendation to the president, and the president could approve or reject that mm -hmm. that uh, recommendation. And okay. that's it. It would be a two-layer layer process. And the, the thinking is to pull that, first of all, pull this out of the Justice Department because, of, as we right. mentioned, that so conflict Right, so the, cle the clemency interest. board's outside of, it's, it's in a different um, organizational strain than the, the prosecutors. Right, exactly. Okay. And also brings criminal justice reformers onto the board because right now they're not represented in the that seven le level process at all. Like the, there are just no no one who is act actively interested in reducing the prison population is represented. So this th it's not that they would be the only people on the board, but they would help balance out the like law enforcement voices on the board who might be interested in more tough on crime stuff. And yeah, that that that's basically the proposal in a nutshell. And this is something that some states currently do with their clemency proposals. Uh, they, they have clemency boards, they make recommendations to the governor, and then the governor can decide what to do with those. Mm -hmm. um, and it's worked. The, another example is just in, after the Vietnam War, uh, Gerald Ford set up a board to grant clemency to thousands of people who dodged the draft. Mm -hmm. These people were not popular at all at the time, but the thinking was they don't really deserve like lengthy prison sentences for what they've done. Vietnam War, we need to move past it. It was a mistake, so on and so forth. And and so yeah, they they set up this again this bipartisan board, really emphasizing the bipartisanship. And it m most people don't even remember this happened. So it kind of speaks to like how well it worked. Like right. there, there were no big problems as yeah. a result of it. Okay. Um, yeah, all of that sounds like a, a fairly a, a more streamlined process. And uh, while, as I said, I think most of the the candidates, including President Trump, have shown a, a willingness a willingness to to commute sentences and to to, to uh, um, offer clemency in certain in certain situations, it seems to be a little bit arbitrary, uh, based on on who comes to their attention, or or alternately, if there's a particular group of people, like with Cory Booker, um, where they want to just pick a group and kind of pardon them. Uh, it does seem like there's more of a, a process at work here with Klobuchar. Uh, out of curiosity, what is what is Biden saying on criminal justice? Because that is when I look at Biden, like the, the two big marks against him from my perspective are the the Iraqi vote and his his criminal justice efforts in the 90s. Is he back wheeled on it uh, or is he just kind of quiet about it? Or is he in this kind of Klobuchar, Kamala Harris? Uh, hey, I'm I was a really tough prosecutor, but now I'm touchy feely. Like, wh where is he on that? So he's been. I don't want to say he's been quiet on it because he has said some stuff. So, like, we mentioned the, the crack, cocaine, powder cocaine sentencing disparity earlier. Um, he's one of the people who wrote that into law. Yeah. So he's ah. one of the people for that. Good job, Joe. And he's at, at least admitted that that was a mistake. Um, he, before he even became vice president, he was actually trying to undo it in the Senate. So, so far, what he's talked about in criminal justice uh, as far as I can tell in his speech, is mostly focused on that, just kind of using that as an example to say, yeah, I'll, he admitted to his credit that I haven't always been on the right side of this. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, he, he hasn't like put out a comprehensive policy proposal for that. I mean, this applies to the Biden campaign in general. Mm -hmm. So far, they're, they're running a lot on, uh, I would say, like sentiment and feeling yeah, it's, against Yeah, it's very Trump. much a, a temperamental campaign. It is not a policy-focused campaign, at least as of yet. Right. And, and so, so, yeah, but, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I get the feeling that 
Biden isn't one of those people who apologizes easily for his past mistakes. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he did at least own up to this one seems to mean something. But it's also a question of like how far is he willing to go? And given his inclinations in the past, how, how much can he be trusted to, to actually enact criminal justice reform? Okay. Well, uh, uh, Herman, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for letting me pick your brain on this issue. And uh, keep up the good work and come back again. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. really appreciate it. A little bit of feedback before we leave today. On iTunes, DJNOK says, Something off, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Something's Off with Andrew Heaton is a creative blend of hilarity, intellectualism, and great conversation. He covers a variety of topics and diverse and informative in these topics. Simply put, his show is fun and informative and could very well be the one thing that's missing in your life. I agree. Thank you, DJ. You can watch this whole show on YouTube if you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. You can see my handsome bearded face and assortment of suits and the dead bison head we screwed to the wall. Watching Something's Off with Andrew Heaton on your computer will only make you seem more sophisticated and amusing at your office or prison cell. Something I frequently say but pertinent to today's program. So go to YouTube and start watching full episodes. Jeremy Bullock says, I look like Lido Atreides if he'd merged with a bookworm instead of a sandworm. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or Facebook me at Facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com and just replying when I send it out occasionally on Fridays. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage, and maybe I'll read it on the show. Thank you very much, and good day.